Good evening and welcome to the Sunderland Select Board meeting. Today is Monday, the 19th of October. <clears throat> Less than 20 days from voting, so make sure you uh, get up there and vote or do whatever you need to do for that. <clears throat> All right, so tonight on our agenda, we've got uh, an appointment with some folks from Mass DOT. I can see we've got Andy Paul, and I believe Richard, you're here for that as well. And I can see Maddie out there for that. <clears throat> and we've also got um, our minutes. We've got a vote to adopt the Sunderland MVP plan and one to approve the Riverside Park conservation restriction. We've got our COVID-19 update and uh, we've got our regular select board updates and town administrator updates. So why don't we, uh, since we've got some guests here, why don't we get started? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, if I could? Yes. Before we take off with that, a uh, note from the town clerk talking about voters and the election since we're early in the meeting, Excellent. saying that uh, voters have taken advantage of uh, mail and voting early, and it's been great. It's a, a reminder that early voting hours are posted at the website, at the town offices, front, of the front and back doors, at the town library, and then again, our election reminder that our election is going to take place at the library on November 3rd from 7, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. I figured I'd put that out there before we got too deep into the meeting. Yep, Thank that's you. a good idea. Thank you. <clears throat> and you can also check the status if you've done a mail-in vote. You can check the status on the website. There are links out there, so you can go out, and it works. Uh, it works quite well. So it'll direct you to a. a it goes to a mass state site where it's all logged in. So. <clears throat> all right. So, um, do you have any uh, intro that you like to do at all, Jeff, to this or? Uh, I don't know if you... No, I, th I think that, um, you know, the village center committee who is also here this evening um, was talking about the, um, any changes to the intersection of route 116 and 47. And yep. um, I haven't heard anything since I started here. So I thought it would be uh, nice to hear directly from MassDOT about um, a little bit of the history and where where we're at today and um, how, how the project is, is moving forward and, and future plans so okay all right thanks and I guess with that we'll turn it over to I'm not sure which one of you at Mass DOT would like to go first but we'll turn it over to you guys okay hey, uh, this is Rich Massey can you hear me okay yep all right and um, Jeff I sent the uh, presentation is there a way to make that uh, yes, visible Great. Okay, so thank you for having us. Um, I'm Richard Massey, the project development engineer in the District 2 office of DOT down in Northampton. And I'm very happy to have with me tonight, Andy Paul. He's the MassDOT Highway Design Engineer. And uh, he and his team will be playing a part in this project as it moves forward. And uh, if you go to the next uh, next page, please. So Andy is uh, part of the MassDOT team that actually worked on our new MassDOT uh, guidelines for roundabouts. It was just published in September of 2020. And uh, Andy and the MassDOT team and our consultant Kittison Associates uh, uh, put that uh, document together. And Andy has considerable experience in uh, roundabout design, not just in Massachusetts, but nationally. And uh, again, I'm, I'm very pleased that he and his group are gonna be helping us as we uh, move this project forward. So if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> so, you know, what we're starting with today, the intersection that's there now is actually a former MassDOT project that we completed in 2002. And uh, that project did have a, a beneficial effect on uh, lowering the crashes there. Um, I found some old uh, FR COG uh, high crash location data that indicates it went down about 37% from before that previous project was built to what was there today. Um, and, you know, some, sometime after we completed that in 2012, the town uh, initiated a project to do North Main Street. And that was approved in 2012. And that went from this intersection at 116 and 47 to Claybrook Road. And because um, the intersection uh, was one of those higher crash locations in the Franklin County region, 
Um, we, we did what's called the road safety audit, which is kind of a, uh, a detailed look at the crashes that are occurring there. And uh, it's a method to come up with uh, recommendations of how you could address the safety issues there. So that road safety audit was by uh, MassDOT and we, uh, the Regional Council of Governments participated and a number of the town, uh, town officials participated as well. So um, coming out of that audit was a recommendation to consider a roundabout and uh, to do updated traffic counts. The uh, FR COG did go ahead and get uh, new traffic counts in 2015. And the town uh, sent a request to Matt Stott for us to go ahead and um, consider a single lane roundabout for the intersection. And the town project was sort of separate now. Um, the North Main Street will go forward on its own. And Mass Dot uh, agreed to do the uh, intersection and work on that design. And that was approved in 2017. And uh, we've done some preliminary analysis and uh, we've done this, completed the survey and prepared a base plan. And um, now we're ready to sort of move towards some real engineering design with the uh, roundabout project. And this is as the town's North Main Street project. Uh, I think bids are gonna be opened uh, in November and that project will be moving towards construction probably uh, beginning of next year. Next page. So this is just a graphical representation of the uh, movements through the intersection. Uh, going from left to right and right to left there is Route 116, the green and red bars and uh, represent the Route 116 traffic entering the intersection. And this is in the afternoon uh, peak hour on the right and the morning peak hour on the left. And you can kind of see the thickness of the line there represents the volume of traffic and you can see the 116 is by far the, the heavier traffic volume. And you can also see that in the morning, it's by far heavier uh, going in the uh, eastbound direction through the intersection, which is south on Route 116. And in the afternoon, then it's going back the other way. And it's something like 60-40 uh, in the peak hours that it's uh, oriented in the uh, direction shown. So Next. could I ask Mr. Chair, oh. and uh, yeah. not to be to interrupt uh, Rich, this is an hourly snapshot? Yes. Um, the, the one on the left is the hour beginning at 7.45 and ending at 8.45 in the morning. And the one on the right is the peak hour beginning at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and going until 5 o'clock. Okay. And I think that's, that's an important piece. The reason I ask is <clears throat> to think that there's you know, nearly 800 cars in one direction in one hour points toward the complexity of the decision making in the design process. Yes, and okay. we'll we'll touch on that a little more as we just go along a little bit. As that was said. a softball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, next. That's not a very good picture though. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> You're gonna watch this change. You're gonna watch this change up. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, um, so this is this is just a very conceptual uh, representation of what a single lane roundabout could look like here. Again, this is not a design; it's just a conceptual uh, graphic. And um, this would be for one lane on each approach entering the roundabout, and single lane of traffic circulating around the roundabout through the whole circle there. And um, you know, this is similar to what uh, you may have seen. We have one of these uh, in Northampton at Look Park at Route 9. Yep. Uh, we've built a single lane roundabout also at Route 5 and Con Street in Northampton. Uh, there's one over at Greenfield Community College. And um, there's one over at UMass, North Pleasant Street. That actually was not a mass dot project, but it is another single lane roundabout. And then we have the double single lane roundabout mm -hmm. over on Route 116 in Bay Road in Amherst at uh, Atkins Corner. And it's a very simple, uh, you know, treatment, and um, and and they work they work pretty well, but you know we do have that issue of those traffic volumes that we talked about. So if you go to uh, the next page, so if you can see it in the uh, yellow and red highlighted boxes here, the top one is um, 
e each movement and what percent of capacity it reaches um, in the afternoon peak. And the afternoon peak does control. So that's, that's what I'm showing here. And you see that even just at the volumes that were counted in 2015, uh, Route 116 westbound is at 97% of capacity with just that one lane entering and one lane circulating around the roundabout from all, from all of the approaches. And uh, the, the bottom box there, the 412, that's the, the length of the queue in feet that would you would expect there that it would be that or shorter basically 95% uh, of the time. So that's about the maximum that you would expect traffic to be uh, backed up on the uh, approach, the westbound approach of Route 116. And then if you grow that uh, 10%, um, so that, um, the, you know, again, that can be 1% for 10 years, a half percent for 20 years, whatever time frame it is, when, when the traffic grows 10%, you know, it's going to be that Route 116 westbound approach, which I think uh, was, you know, in, in thousand uh, range, uh, or certainly at least departing the intersection, you're like 12% over capacity. And the length of that uh, backup on that approach in that afternoon hour is up to, you know, 650 feet. And um, so a single lane is, you know, really at the point where that, that heaviest movement is sort of at and starting to uh, uh, exceed capacity with, with some growth. Go to the next, please. Everidge, could I just add a couple things on the analysis? Oh, sure, Andy, thank you. Sure. On, the, um, on the, the model that we use to do the analysis, um, it's developed um, based off of national statistics, using averages based off of data collected from hundreds of intersections. Um, and it's just that, it's, a, it's an average of those. And what we have found anecdotally in Massachusetts is that um, drivers behave differently than the average, as you might su suspect. Um, and in cases like this, where it is borderline, we usually anticipate that people will um, be able to navigate the intersection more efficiently than what's seen here. And um, if it's a borderline case that like this, we can use other models uh, to do the analysis to help um, us determine whether or not our assumptions are correct. Um, Rich had mentioned the 95th percentile queue. So it's either at or below that 95% of the time. So only 5% of the time is the queue as long as what's projected on here. As we develop this further, we'll, um, we'll model what the average queues are, which I think is a little bit more helpful for uh, planning purposes. Um, and then the assumptions that Rich mentioned about the, the growth are, are also important to note. Um, you know, that 10% could be uh, half a percent per year over 20 years or 1% over one year. We can do sensitivity analysis if there's more projection in one region than another or less. Um, we can always um, model that as well. So a few different scenarios that we could look into as part of our planning process. I actually have a, a quick question, if I could, just like because you're projecting, trying to project out, you know, future growth. Like, what about have you looked at um, uh, self-driving cars and how that will affect it at all? Um, that's, first, that's just first, over the horizon. Sure. For um, we do, and there's okay. um, I think a couple different ways to look at it. One is Richard mentioned this intersection, kind of went through the uh, the capital program about a decade and a half ago. Um, so depending on the investment that we're making, if it were if this were a bridge structure, say that we're putting in, uh, and the intersection adjacent to that bridge we're proposing a roundabout, and that bridge we we're planning on being there for 50 years, we'd think about it a little bit differently. Um, than say a standalone intersection like this, where it's likely that in 15 or 20 years, we'll be back maybe to uh, either do just a typical resurfacing and maintenance project, or maybe even in reconstruct the intersection. Okay. Um, and it, with, uh, with self-driving guards and roundabouts, it's, it's somewhat unique. The um, drivers are actually pretty, uh, human behavior is actually pretty efficient. And they found um, that through the research that's been done, 
uh, that they're able to process uh, anywhere between like 14 and 1600 vehicles per hour for a single lane roundabout like this. Um, so again, near the thresholds that we're talking about, but there's some um, efficiencies that could be made up from self-driving cars, but really until you've got 80 or 90 or even close to 100% saturation, are you gonna actually be able to model that as well? Okay. <clears throat> And we just had just one question about um, the Atkins roundabouts because they've been in for how, how long have those been in? Oh, Probably goodness. Um, at least I think five, it, it, right? It, it must be going on 10 years. Okay. Because um, uh, somebody was curious about what the traffic change there versus the projected has been. And, and I noticed I used, yeah, I used to take that every day, and that, and that was a vast improvement, I know, on getting through that intersection. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to check and see how much traffic may have grown there since it was constructed and see what kind of growth that I experienced. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next page. So this is kind of, you know, if, you know, there was that significant traffic growth and you know, uh, as Andy mentioned, you can look at the average queues also to help in the decision-making process. But, you know, if it was determined that, um, you know, we should look at the, the next or one of the next um, um, sizes of this uh, intersection, uh, one of the things you could look at is a two-lane approach on each of the Route 116 approaches here. And uh, again, this is just a, uh, uh, you know, very conceptual level of what a two-lane approach on each of the 116 approaches would look like. Two-lane approach and two-lane departure. And then for, for two of the quadrants of the circle, there are two lanes of traffic circulating around the roundabout. And on the north and south Main Street legs, there's only one lane. And um, the, the red lines here, uh, the dashed lines in the uh, three of the quadrants represent an approximation of where the back of the sidewalk would be if you needed to uh, build out to a two lane approach and departure on each of the Route 116 legs. And um, if you go to the next uh, next page. So obviously that makes you know a huge difference in the capacity. And uh, there's a line there, uh, volume to capacity ratio that for both the 2015 volume and the 10% growth, it's at like half capacity, which I think may, maybe is kind of intuitive since the other one was about at capacity at a single lane approach. And, uh, you know, so, so this one operates, you know, quite well on the traffic volumes. Uh, it's got really a lot of excess capacity and, uh, uh, Andy, I don't know, maybe at this point you want to jump in. That's not always, you know, really good that yeah. um, um, you're, you, you overbuild it uh, so much. And if you want to speak to that. Yeah, sure. So if you're, um, if you've shown through your modeling that you're going to have excess capacity, usually what that can lead to is higher operating speeds. With um, the multi-lane roundabout on the previous slide, what you can see is that if there's no one in the lane adjacent to you, uh, drivers can always use what's called the fastest path where they would actually um, say traverse the intersection and change lanes within the intersection. And so they can go a little bit faster than what you would anticipate. Um, there's things we do to mitigate that where we make uh, the entry geometry like a, a sharper curve so that it forces drivers to slow down um, even more. But uh, more, more and more we're leaning towards um, not overbuilding these intersections and instead trying to, as much as possible, utilize uh, single lane operations within the intersection. Um, and so I think that's where we would do further analysis to look at it, but that's um, certainly a strategy here that we would look to employ. Thanks, Andy. So the, the next page, and, and this is again, the graphical representation of those, you know, 95% cues, which is 
um, you know, it's kind of the max you would expect and 95% of the time they'll be shorter than that. And as Andy mentioned, you know, a, a good piece of information to have would be what would the average, you know, 50% of the time, what would the Q be? And that's something that um, they can look at as they get into some more detailed analysis of this. But the red lines here represent those 95% cues for the single lane roundabout. And the yellow lines, which are very short, um, show you know, how, how really well uh, or, or, or how much capacity the two lane uh, approach on Route 116 in each direction has if you go to that. And um, again, you see, you see it's, a, it's a vast difference. Uh, next. So, you know, we touched on a few of the things. Um, and, you know, these are some of the uh, considerations. Um, we've talked about some of them, you know, other approach configurations. Um, Andy, are there sort of some um, in between um, the, you know, what we've shown here is the one lane approach and departure and two lane approach and departure that would be worth looking at? Um, yeah, there's the, the phased out build approach that you've noted here is the second one on there where, um, you know, we, we could consider if there was uh, a borderline case like this, uh, the opportunity to say build a single lane roundabout in uh, the opening year of construction, let's say, and I think we did this at Atkins, but then allow for um, the geometry to be expanded upon. So the intersection could be widened in, in future years if needed. Um, and so uh, that's, a technique that we've employed in other locations and could be utilized here, depending on the outcomes of the, the design and operational analyses. Right. And is there like a right turn lane um, on the approach where it, it would be an additional approach lane and, and not necessarily an additional uh, departure yeah. lane on the other side? Yep. So if we look at um, the uh, traffic volumes through the intersection, if there's heavy right turn or heavy left turns, um, you can in, you could install just those turn lanes at the intersection as opposed to a, a through lane as well. As, as opposed to two through lanes, you could have a through lane and a right turn only lane. Um, and that can help with some of the capacity where then you don't have to build out, say, the full intersection as two lanes and just perhaps one or two of the approaches. Right. Um, I, I should mention that was that was something that we considered when we did uh, Con Street in Northampton. That's the intersection of Route 5 down near the bowling alley in Northampton. And uh, Con Street in that in that three, it's really a three-legged roundabout there, uh, had that high volume of right turns. And, and we considered that. Uh, in that case, you know, it's it's kind of tight with the development that's there on the south edge of uh, downtown Northampton. And uh, you know, we made a conscious decision that the, the benefit of that added right turn lane wasn't enough for the impact that it had on the abutting properties in order to get you know, the width to put it in there. So you know, that's one of those uh, things with the information you can, you know, with, with a good, good amount of information, it can help you make those decisions about uh, what, what to build and, and what to uh, move forward with. Um, and um, pedestrian safety, I know, um, so this is something, you know, we, we've had feedback from the town over the years about the issues with uh, pedestrians crossing there. We've made some upgrade to the pedestrian signals there. Uh, there's also been issues with uh, bicycle crashes and, um, you know, taking care of, you know, not making it all about the vehicles. You know, we need to also consider the other uh, modes of travel that are occurring there. And given this location in the, you know, the very center of the town, there, there, there is, you know, a fair amount of that other bicycle and pedestrian activity, and that, you know, we want to make, you know, whatever roundabout configuration there, we want to make that safe, and, um, you know, there, there's a number of ways to control the traffic as it approaches the places where the pedestrians will cross, and. Um, Andy, you, you were mentioning, you know, we haven't done it yet in District 2, the raised crosswalk approach in terms of uh, getting the vehicles to really slow down as they as they reach the roundabout. Um, yep. And uh, if you could just touch on that. 
Yeah, so one of the um, techniques that we're using when we're designing the roundabout is to get the entering traffic to be going the same speed as the circulating traffic. And a lot of times you can do that with just curves within the road. And so you're dictating how fast the vehicle can go based off of the curve of the and the circulatory roadway. Um, sometimes that operating speed is uh, projected to be between 18 and 22 miles per hour, which is a, a good speed for drivers to be yielding to pedestrians. They're scanning the road closer to them as they're driving. Um, and so in some instances, in order to reinforce that, we'll also raise the crosswalk. I'm sure um, you may have seen some treatments like this um, just at a mid-block crosswalk or just a crosswalk along a, a straight roadway. By introducing it at the roundabout, um, you're just helping to reinforce um, that speed reduction as part of uh, the intersection treatment and it helps to reinforce then the yielding behavior that drivers should be using to pedestrians that are crossing at the crosswalk. Right. Um, Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so so where so there would be no you you would no longer activate any type of light um, with a sidewalk and so I, I guess you'd no longer be pushing a button. So you would just wait for the cars to yield for you to cross. Is that correct? Um, there, that's correct if we didn't use any activation. Um, but we could also, Rich, as uh, you can see on the slide here, that there are uh, pedestrian hybrid beacons or some, in some cases, uh, other types of treatment. I'll okay. reinforce it. And and where where would the, where would the pedestrian crosswalk be kind of like in relation to the, the roundabout? Would it be more towards the bridge now uh, on the west side or kind of in the same location? Where, where would the people be crossing? It would yeah, be- I, I think if you go to the two lane roundabout there, it's got a good depiction of the crosswalks. Yep. And it would be something like that with either the one or two lane approach, I think. Yeah, so pretty pretty close to where they are now. If, if you're a little bit closer, if you're working with a single lane roundabout, just because the diameter is smaller, a little bit further away, if you've got the double lane roundabout, you want to locate them about one vehicle length away from the edge of the circulatory roadway. And what yep. that allows for is the vehicle to be stopped and looking for circulating, circulating traffic while a pedestrian can still cross um, and not be blocked by that vehicle. So you set it back about 25 feet. And it looks it it looks it looks like it's a little bit um, a lot of it, it the roundabouts originally were more kind of like were perpendicular to the circle. Mm -hmm. Now it's looking like you're entering more on a ta tangential. Yeah, that's that's not always great. This this graphic is the multi lane roundabout. Um, so on that um, tangent. Um, you can achieve higher speeds. The vehicle can go faster. The, the one that's shown now, the single, it's more perpendicular. And so okay. you're slowing vehicles down. That's why the single lane roundabout in this case is preferred. Or even though you see that curvilinear, the tangential approach is faster, yep. that's yep. where maybe you might want to introduce the raised crossings to help reinforce the slower speeds. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, if you wanna just go back to the last page again, please. So um, yeah, um, the sketches really didn't show, you know, a detail on bicycles, but I've clipped out uh, something from our guide, that little uh, uh, image that you see there on this page. Um, those are little uh, ramps from the shoulder before you get into the actual approach to the roundabout and it allows uh, someone who's on a bike in the shoulder approaching to use a little ramp to get up to what would be a widened sidewalk or a shared use path going uh, around the roundabout. And um, so that would be probably like an eight or 10 foot wide path once the bikes are added in um, past where the, where the sidewalk ends. And there was one question, Rich, from Mr. Pelletier um so we do recommend the separated 
uh, path has shown, it's kind of, might not be perfectly shown on the graphic. Um, what it's showing though is just transitioning back to on-road uh, bike lanes. If there are separated bike lanes that can connect to uh, beyond the project limits, certainly that could be accommodated as well. Okay. And uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, uh, sort of, you know, over being designing way over capacity. And, you know, that's again, something to keep in mind that there is that very busy afternoon peak hour, but outside of that, you know, you've got considerably lower volumes and, um, you know, that's something again that um, some more analyses of the various alternatives will, will give better information on sort of how, how important or not it is to have that, um, the second lane on, on like the higher volume approaches there. Um, and something that, you know, I think we need to keep in mind here is that I think right now, or at least, you know, pre-COVID, that, you know, people may be using a round, uh, pardon the expression, a roundabout way to get through this intersection and getting off of 116 and maybe using like South Main Street and finding that it's actually quicker to get through there to go up and take a left turn from South Main Street to go across the bridge than to just stay going north on, on or west on Route 116. So, um, you know, we, we do want as much as possible that if, if we do something here, hopefully it it doesn't have to encourage people to sort of take, you know, a, a, a different route and get onto some of the lesser streets uh, just to get through this intersection, you know, a, a little faster. And, and the other thing, again, there's there are a number of driveways here, especially on 116 south or east of the intersection. And, you know, um, depending again on the percentages, you know, some of those driveways will be blocked, you know, more of the time in that uh, peak hour. And um, that'll be, again, some of that information that that 50% that uh, uh, we'll, we'll get an analysis for will be uh, useful in uh, decision making. And, uh, and you know, and besides the driveway access, there's the actual physical uh, impacts on the abutting property. You know, these, these really were kind of sketch level uh, alternatives. And now that we have, you know, the survey, the ground survey and the base plan done, you know, this is something that Andy and his group can uh, work uh, into more detail and find out where not just the back of the sidewalk is, but where the grading to accomplish, you know, uh, that, that back of sidewalk location needs to occur and what kind of impact that has on the surrounding parcels as well. And I think we touched on a little bit, you know, again, a single lane roundabout has fewer conflict points than a, a multi-lane roundabout. And that's another thing to think about before, you know, jumping to uh, multi-lanes just because they provide, um, you know, superior operation and shorter queues. So I think that's it for now. So a Andy and his group, again, I I'm very pleased. They're gonna be uh, taking what we have and uh, using the survey. And um, I don't know if we'll have a chance to get some updated traffic counts. It's not a good time to do, uh, to be trying to count uh, typical traffic right now, but uh, uh, they'll be moving forward with kind of uh, fleshing out uh, the two alternatives we show here, maybe some intermediate alternatives and developing some information that we can come back with. Um, we're, we're calling it, I think a pre 25% uh, level design, but it should provide a lot of information to help you know, further discussion and uh, uh, consideration of what, what this could look like as it moves forward. Um, I, I should note the project is currently not funded for construction. It will need to be on the Franklin County tip to actually be advertised for MassDOT. But you know, we're hopeful that as we, we uh, Andy's group can develop more information on this and we can maybe get some uh, consensus on what the project that, that we will advance looks like, that uh, you know, the further along we get in design, that the better consideration the project gets when it's time to uh, program the, the tip funds in the Franklin County region. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what we really need to actually make it happen here. David, can I hop in there? Yeah, mm -hmm. good. 
Um, so we're also here on the uh, Lauren Starr, I'm the chair of the Village Center Committee, and uh, our uh, our members are also here tonight, and we we actually asked for this meeting. Um, so we were appointed about a year ago specifically to look at um, the entire village center and uh, particularly how the intersection uh, would be impact uh, would impact that. And I think we are uh, I think our work has been held up a little because of COVID, and we're trying to look for some grant funding to look at um, options for the village center. But I'm not sure that it was clear to any of us that we were kind of this, even this far along in looking at a roundabout, which I got, you know, so I, I think that our committee has a fair amount of skepticism uh, about. So I guess I just wanna ask a couple of questions. Um, one is um, in all the roundabouts that you mentioned as um, examples, uh, none of them are in the, what we would consider center of town. And, you know, I think we do have a significant, you know, we have had traffic issues here. Um, you know, we do uh, consider this the kind of town center and we feel there's a very strong link um, visually and for pedestrians between North and South Maine. And we're quite concerned about breaking that up um, with an intervention that seems like, you know, good for traffic, but maybe not so good for a friendly center of town. Um, in your discussion, even of traffic volumes, I guess, um, you know, since the initial um, request was made to look at the intersection, um, you, I think just, I think just really shortly before March, um, when you put the turn signal in, uh, that made an incredible difference in the backup of the traffic. And I'm not sure that we really got to even see that through because once COVID hit and uh, the traffic volumes really dropped back, you know, obviously we haven't had any of our problems. Um, and, uh, but that did seem to have actually a very big impact on, on traffic flow and the backup that we were having during rush hour. Um, I think it also begs the question of, um, post COVID, I mean, our traffic is clearly UMass driven traffic mm -hmm. and what part of UMass remains remote? How many people stay working from home? Um, you know, do we see, does all the traffic come back or doesn't it? We were, I think that's something we really don't know. And it seems sort of premature to plan for what we're not, for a, a change that may, may be coming. Um, and I think there were some, and also some uh, people had mentioned in the uh, chat there that, um, you know, we are talking about a backup during a very, um, during a very short period of time. And so I think overbuilding just doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. So I guess my first question would be, what are the alternatives to a roundabout? Okay, um, so, you know, the alternative is the, the traffic signal that's there today. And, um, you know, you can also, you know, if, if capacity is an issue with the signal that's there today, um, with, the, with the traffic signal, you can look at adding lanes and, you know, that has uh, different impacts, but additional impacts on, on the intersection. Uh, we didn't talk about it too much, but one of the things that Andy and his group will do is, uh, I think, an intersection control evaluation. And you know, the reason we 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 like to consider roundabouts, and we do, um, you know, uh, put them high on our list of intersection types to consider, is because typically they do have a very large impact on safety. And when you you know do a an analysis of that, maybe Andy, you can talk to this, of sort of the cost of continuing, you know, with a signalized intersection versus converting to a roundabout. It's actually uh, usually pretty impressive of the the cost savings that there is in in terms of the the safety and sometimes the delay uh, with having a roundabout versus a traffic signal. Do you want maybe touch on that, Andy? Yeah, sure. We um, 
We use uh, the highway safety manual, uh, which is a recommended tool through the Federal Highway Administration for doing safety analyses. And when comparing a signalized intersection uh, that was replaced with a roundabout, it's been shown to reduce uh, fatalities and serious injuries by up to uh, 90%. On average, it's about 70 to 75%. So it's a, a very significant safety countermeasure that we have for intersections. Uh, one of the first slides that Rich had up was the, uh, the crash statistics from the road safety audit that was conducted, I believe in 2017. Oh, yep, it's on that slide there. And so you see the uh, EPDO, which is equivalent property damage only. So it's uh, just a ratio that's used per MEV or million entering vehicles. So when um, the intersection treatment was put in place uh, about 15 years ago, that showed to reduce the crashes from two, the ratio to two point from 2.09 to 1.32. Um, while that's very significant, the 1.32 is still well above uh, the district and state average, which is closer to 0 0.90, so less than one. Um, and when replacing a roundabout, you're going to significantly reduce that even more. So it's really a safety function, and then um, balancing that with an operational perspective. And I agree with you, uh, Ms. Starr, about the, uh, the need to uh, not overbuild. Um, and so when we're working with other communities, it's really, we're presenting alternatives, but we wanna listen as well to hear what the priorities are for the town. You mentioned uh, the traffic at UMass, to and from UMass, how much of that is going to be remote. We do have data statewide that we're collecting that we can compare historically to 2019, 18, 17, and even as far back as 2016. Uh, and we can look at trends on how much has returned to date, so October of 2020, and compare that to October of 2019 or other previous years, um, and try to build that into our sensitivity analysis. It already looks like um, a, a single lane roundabout would work and maybe have um, some very acute time periods where there could be some delay, and we'll do further analysis on that as well. Um, the connected to the downtown and being integrated into the downtown, we have uh, roundabouts that we've built um, in city centers and on uh, college campuses and as part of uh, development projects uh, that can be used as a gateway treatment to help reinforce the slower speeds that you might be looking for in an area where there'll be people walking or biking or other um, commercial business use in and around the area. Uh, uh, and at some points you can even uh, use the center island of the roundabout um, to, um, to, to, to reinforce that and really make it a part of uh, the downtown area. Um, some have decorated or landscaped the inside of the center island uh, to reflect say, um, some natural or um, historic um, uh, context. Um, worked on a project in um, Annapolis, Maryland, where they really wanted to reinforce the uh, historic nature of their downtown area. Um, and it was used as the roundabout uh, was used as a gateway treatment into Annapolis, Maryland, and in downtown uh, Worcester, adjacent to the train station. Um, you know, they didn't, uh, they wanted to just use uh, more natural landscaping, including like bushes, uh, flowers, and other ornamental structures like uh, wrought iron fencing. So there's different, different techniques that you can use to try to incorporate the, uh, the intersection into the surrounding area. Um, and then I think the intersection control evaluation that Rich uh, mentioned is something that we'll be undertaking where you you measure the safety outcomes that I talked about. Um, and then you also measure the operational outcomes and you weigh that against the construction costs, the environmental impacts, um, or any other impacts that might be realized as part of the intersection project. I don't 
thing, this is Liz, I'm on the Village Center Committee. And, and one of the things, I mean, I'm looking at the Glens Falls example that was cited. And you now the issue for us in part is that traffic coming on 116 is going 35 miles an hour. I mean, it's not already in Glens Falls. I've been on that intersection. You're already kind of crawling along. And what we want is a way to stop people and we also want kids to be safe crossing. I don't know if you've got little kids, but you know, kids go across the street all the time to go to the playing fields. We want, I, the, it terrifies me to think of a little kid having to watch for the cars and figure out how to cross safely. That just seems like a, I just, I can't even, I can't conceive of how we can make that safe without full yep. stop. I mean, I love what we have now is the four way full stop. That just feels yep. so good. I think, um, thank you, Elizabeth, great question. Um, the, uh, so the, the differences between the signal and the roundabout, um, certainly we could spend a lot of time talking about those. The roundabout, what, what you end up with is not that red versus green, where with a green light at a signal, people can continue to go through at that 35 miles per hour, whereas at a roundabout, you just have consistent operating speeds throughout the day and throughout the the time that folks would be there. Um, I do have uh, three young kids uh, and there is, there's a roundabout not far from my kid's school, just coincidentally. I didn't like move here to live next to a roundabout. Um, but one of the advantages is that at a roundabout, you're only crossing, at a single lane roundabout especially, you're only crossing one direction of traffic at a time. So you cross from the, the sidewalk to what's called a splitter island or the island in between the approaches. Um, so you're just crossing that one lane and you're only crossing and you only need to be observing traffic coming from one direction or the other. Um, and the, the speed at which the vehicles are operating um, is, is much slower than it would be at a signal. If there is a need, you know, if there's um, some cases where we've, we, where we've worked with communities where it was adjacent to a school or, um, an independent living center or, or the town hall um, where we've uh, on the last slide, Rich showed some other countermeasures that you can include. Um, those are called pedestrian hybrid beacons, which is very similar to a signal. Uh, it goes red, you push the button, you know, you push the button, it goes red and allows for you to cross the street. Um, there's a couple other uh, different types of the rep, uh, rapid flashing beacons. Um, are just a high intensity LED flasher. It's also push button activated. Uh, it just helps reinforce that someone's crossing the street. Um, or the, the raised crosswalk treatment as well is used in other instances um, to help lower those speeds. One thing though that you mentioned too was just that speeds on this road maybe are higher than in other contexts that, that were referenced. So what we do is we take that into account in the design um, and on the, the splitter island itself, that's the, basically the median that you're going to see as you're approaching the roundabout, you would introduce that median further away from the intersection uh, for a higher speed approach. And what that does is it um, sends a signal to the driver that the context is changing. It's physically narrowing the roadway that they're driving in um, and so you, based off that narrowing effect, it alerts the driver. And then there's curves that you build into the design of that median to help reinforce, again, the, the slower speed. So depending on the approach speed and the context, oftentimes you'll carry that splitter island back further away from the inter intersection. Have you ever have you ever taken have you ever put in a roundabout simply ended up taking it out because it didn't work? Um, not in Massachusetts. Um, probably the closest we've come, Tom, is uh, by uh, modifying one that was built. Um, there's one in uh, Duxbury. It was actually the first roundabout that was constructed in Massachusetts in the 90s, um, and they didn't. Um, you know, have the benefit of some of the experiences that we've had since then. And they didn't introduce that um, deflection angle that I'm talking about. And so vehicles uh, could go straight through and, and didn't have anything reinforcing that they were supposed to yield to the circulating traffic. And so we had to modify the median island, 
um, and uh, change, modify some of the signage. Um, in downtown Worcester, I think I'd mentioned Washington Square. Uh, I think that's a case where we maybe did overbuild the intersection. You see it's well below uh, the capacity of that intersection. So people um, can navigate through there at faster speeds. And so there they used uh, the rectangular rapid flashing beacon and other things to help uh, with the pedestrian crossing treatments there. Um, the, uh, we also here in Massachusetts uh, have a lot of uh, rotary intersections that are not designed uh, like uh, what a modern roundabout would look like. And so there are, there are many cases where we've replaced um, rotaries um, with a variety of treatments. In some cases, we've replaced rotaries with roundabouts. Um, we've also replaced rotaries with signals or other types of um, interchanges as well. I, I can vouch for that. I, for the last several years, I've been working down by that one at Agawam on uh, yep. where 50 cent. And that, that is an absolute nightmare of a rotary, yep. that one. Yeah. Uh, because you do, you have people speeding through their switching lanes without signaling in the middle of it while somebody's pulling in. And there are, there's a lot of accidents in that place. Yep. And the, um, just to give you some context, uh, the largest rotary in Massachusetts is in uh, Revere off of Route 1, and it's called Copeland Circle. Yep. Um, that's, that's over 1,000 feet in diameter, um, as opposed to the intersection that's on the screen here is only uh, about 100 to 120 feet across. So you get much slower speeds at a roundabout than you do at a rotary. Yeah. Yeah. Um. What, what are you guys looking at for a timeline in terms of your analysis and everything? And getting back to us, like, what do you think that timeline would look like? Yeah, Rich had mentioned the pre-25. That's where we do a further analysis than what's being presented this evening. Uh, and then um, using the ground survey that's been conducted, uh, do a further refined uh, design than what's shown tonight as well. Um, that can take anywhere from three to six months, um, depending on if we have all the questions answered. Many of the ones that are being asked tonight are very um, informative. Um, I think so getting to pre-25, I'd say, is about six months conservatively. And then, Rich, I think then the discussion is with more with the, uh, from a funding perspective, um, are we able to take advantage of um, working with the region or other statewide programs to fit it in from a funding perspective. But I'll let Rich speak to that. Yeah, yeah. Again, at some point, you know, if anything is going to be built, um, it will need to be programmed on the Franklin uh, Franklin County Transportation Improvement Program. And you know, right now, um, it's programmed through 2025. There is some funding that's not currently programmed to projects within those years, but um, you know I think uh, hopefully after you know we get to pre twenty five we can come back and present present what we have and see you know what concerns might remain uh, from the community and sort of start thinking about. Again, is it worth putting more effort into advancing it at that point? If we do have some sense that we it's a project that we could get funded in the program, um, and um, you know, make some additional decisions on that uh, based on the feedback after uh, presenting the additional uh, information. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I could, yeah, please. So, uh, Rich, and thanks for the presentation and for the for the work your team's done to this point. More importantly, for the quick efforts you guys put into the traffic signal adjustments uh, that have really proven to be helpful. Um, I have a question about one of our resident businesses that's just north of this intersection that has large, long vehicles that have to make that intersection on a pretty uh, frequent basis. Maybe I see Jim is here. Maybe he can talk to the total length of some of those trioxo low boys. And is there enough room to get those through that intersection without impacting that business? 
Do you want me to take this one here? Sure. sure. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Sure. Um, so the 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 low boys, as you mentioned, are um, kind of in the three dimension is something that we have to worry about with height. So that red area that's in, uh, shown on the center island of the roundabout is actually a mountable service surface. Um, and so uh, specifically with low boys, oftentimes we'll look to make that about uh, three inches as opposed to more standard four to six inch. Um, it's called a, a truck apron. Yep. Um, so trucks are able to are are are, um, are, are it, yes able to to mount the inter that surface uh, depending on the types of vehicles and what turning movements they're making through the intersection um, will change will modify the dimensions of those uh, but oftentimes if trucks are just going straight through it's not as much of a challenge as if they are turning um, a, a right turn specifically. Um, it's the, the one movement through the intersection that we have to um, really look most closely at. So as you uh, look at that, at that route, at that current uh, diagram, and it says Route 47, that right where 47 ends is the beginning of the access road to where that equipment will be taking a left onto, your inter onto this intersection, yep. and then either right or left through it. Okay. So, so we do... A lot of long, low traffic that can go through that space. So we'll do uh, modeling of different vehicle types and we'll show the vehicles swept path through the intersection and we'll either um, change the treatment if needed um, to make the surface mountable by larger vehicles or just move the, the curb depending on um, what the geometry is of the intersection. Got it. I just wanted to put that out there. They're a you know, yep. prominent yeah, community that's... business and we want to take care of them. Yep, that's an excellent point. <clears throat> yeah, for other vehicle types, um, if you've got any uh, school buses or um, uh, regional buses that go through here, we'll also design the intersection so that it can accommodate those buses without having to go up on that apron and um, you know jostle folks who are in any transit vehicles. A lot of times we'll work very closely with um, the emergency response folks in the area if there are um, any rear steer ladder trucks or other articulated vehicles that they use for emergency response to make sure that they can make those movements as well. Yeah, yeah and the, somebody had mentioned too there are, like you, you, we were just saying that <clears throat> we've got the PVTA buses and there's regular buses and then the articulated ones and they probably don't have as much of an issue. Yeah. Um, Another oddity from geometry is we have some uh, unique agricultural equipment that rolls through that can be very wide and very tall. That's okay. true. In um, Kansas, they have a lot of uh, wind farms and they, there you go. Those are lo very long. And so sometimes they'll come up with some pretty unique solutions for not just um, the, the getting the vehicles through, but like, it's very temporary. Like they only need to deliver things. A blade. Once. Right. <laughs> Right. right. Yep. So, they'll yeah, down the highway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Think about a 20 foot harvester rolling through there. 20 yes. foot wide harvester rolling through there. What do you do with that? Yeah. I just um, ask if anyone else on the village center committee has anything that they wanted to uh, chime in with. I didn't see yeah, that I, one I, question I, about the flagpole. Well, I think that, that, I mean, I guess that goes to basically process and at what point are, you know, various materials, amenities, you know, other local considerations looked at. And I guess uh, I'm frankly a little confused about where we're at in this process because it was not, I don't think that clear that we were this far into uh, the rotary solution. Um, another question I have is just if you could talk a little bit about the businesses who are at the corners or near the corners, not just the ones with trucks, but yeah, we've got the, the all those the little stores and right and you know sort of what your experience is with how people successfully navigate entering and exiting, especially those that are right close to the corner. Sure, um, and maybe to uh, answer Lauren's question about process. I I would um, I would hesitate to say we're all that far along. This is just some 
analysis and very conceptual level sketches that were developed the that next stage that we're talking about that pre 25 percent is just that it's before you're getting to any um engineering contract documents uh and as part of that we're doing an intersection control evaluation which will include not just the roundabout but also signalization um so we'll still um we'll still do that analysis and present those outcomes as part of that pre-25 process. And then even after that, there's a 25% uh, design public hearing where um, MassDOT hosts a public hearing with the community to get their feedback. Uh, I like to hear from the community obviously before that so that we're um, not just doing things in a silo. And so this is, um, to me, the very beginning of the process, we're just coming on uh, from a design perspective and um, felt that this would be beneficial. So we wanna hear those things from you. On the access issue to and from the adjacent uh, properties, the commercial or otherwise is also very important. So um, the driveways as they exist today, um, we would work very closely with those abutters to make sure that the access is maintained to those properties, both in and out of the, the properties. If there's any that are impacted, we still wanna have the, the, the same full access and not restrict it um, to those facilities. If this were um, like a, a, a Route 9 or something that was median divided, I think that the context would be somewhat different, uh, but here where the road is mostly just a double yellow center line, state routes intersecting at perpendicular approaches, um, in most cases, maybe we've had to modify the access, but not eliminate it. I would anticipate that being the case here. Yeah, one of the problems we have now with businesses is because of the lights and the signal, it blocks traffic. And then oftentimes it prevents people from entering or exiting those businesses because of the block traffic. Andy, could I uh, make a point on the uh, trailers and such that go through the intersection? Sure, please. I think, um, you know, you see 116, they're just not going 116 east and west. And there's a lot of traffic that'll go east on 116 that ends up having to go north on 47. Okay. And stuff and traffic that goes uh, west on 116 that's going to have to go south on 47. Not only the company that I work for, which is Warner Brothers, but the farmers now with the potatoes, long trailers, they're, they're using 47 a lot. So it's, yep. they're going to have to navigate three quarters of the way around the road away with the trailers. And so typically like this, where we've got state route to state route intersection, um, we'll do for each approach, you have three turns left you know, or three movements you can make left, right, or straight ahead. And so we'll do, it's kind of like a matrix of uh, models that we'll build for each approach, those three movements. And then may, we might even, so then you have three times four, you have 12 uh, different graphics that we'll look at uh, just for this one intersection. And then we might even have, that might be for one vehicle, like a bus or a fire truck or a tractor of some sort or a low boy. So for each one of those vehicles, we'll do those 12 different scenarios. Uh, those being left, right and straight for each approach. Um, and then you overlay those on top of one another to fit, fit, do a best fit of where the curb line should be. I also had one further question. When you had earlier talked about uh, possibly with a single lane roundabout, adding some dedicated right-hand turns. Yep. Does that help in the peak hours? Yeah, so that's, um, you know, the, this in this scenario here, um, you know, we just presented two alternatives, those being the sing full single lane or the double lane for 116. Um, you can further refine those just doing the peak hour analysis. If let's say there's a heavy right turn or left turn in one direction or the other, um, that can help with the peak hours. Uh, it can also help with uh, truck swept path as well. You end up with a wider approach, um, so. Thank you. 
So I guess the challenge is uh, those issues in addition to, I think, our pedestrian and town center issues. So I think as Liz mentioned earlier, you know, we do have kids coming from the school crossing to go to the library or the playing fields. We've got a new senior housing uh, project coming on uh, off of 47, uh, off of North Main, uh, which, you know, is counting on pedestrian use of the uh, access to the town center and to the bus routes, et cetera. And I just hope that when we uh, see you next, that we also have some more, I, I challenge you to give us some more examples of this solution in a town center versus in a place where we're just trying to move traffic. Absolutely. Andy, um, there's a roundabout at um, Look Park. Is there any special pedestrian things that were installed there because of Look Park? I believe a bike trail enters that yep. roundabout and also not far from that roundabout is JFK Middle School, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right, yep. Rich, I know the, the path goes through that intersection. Do you know if they did any additional treatments for the path crossing? Yeah, I, I don't recall offhand, I can check. We paved it and I don't remember, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while ago. Yeah, it was. Just love to have some kind of full stop option. It just scares the living daylights out of me to think of little kids going through there and cars not paying attention and they're going up in the evening. I just, I really have a hard time believing in this whole safety concept for kids and elderly. And I think um accessibility for people of all ages and ability is our top priority for all of the intersections we're building whether they're signals or roundabouts um we work very closely with folks at the federal level and the u.s access board as well as the architectural access board locally here in massachusetts um and have had to um uh seek their input on a variety of uh, implementation. So at the statewide level, in addition to the work that I'm doing here, I'm also working on um, an ADA transition plan on how we can make our infrastructure in the Commonwealth more accessible to folks. So um, access and safety obviously go hand in hand and is something that will be a priority here. And I know it's Rock made a comment, which I was actually just gonna make the same thing. I think as a pedestrian, I find these actually much safer because at any crossing point as an individual, you only have to be concerned with traffic coming from one direction as opposed to if I'm crossing the intersection now, I've got easily at, least, at a bare minimum two ways of traffic I have to look for. So that, that is something that it did, does from a pedestrian safety standpoint make it a lot better. Yeah, but since they put the four-way stop in, that is great. That does help. Yeah. Yep. That is great. The one yep. thing if Dave, if I could, yeah, let's let's not forget that when we when when we first talked to the state about the four way stop, there was a lot of pushback. Yes, right about how yeah. it wouldn't work. So what I would say is that we can all have opinions, mm -hmm. but we have to have. I think we say it in politics a lot. You have to have an open mind and mm -hmm. and bring your concerns. And and it's the state's job, Mass DOT, to. And, and, and we, when we first put the signals, change the signals, it didn't work, but they worked on it. And Scott said it before, and, and I, I just want to reiterate, you, Mass DOT did a wonderful job when, yep, when they, on those signals. So you, you got to keep an open mind. And, and your con the, the concern that you had, Liz, is, is, is a concern that every parent and every person at I think is a safety of that intersection for pedestrians. Cause we do, cause, I mean, I've crossed that intersection since I've been five years old. So I, I agree. And that was our, that was our original impetus to, to try to get changes there because of a near, of a very, very near miss on a, on a young pedestrian. So I think that's a continuation of that, that, and, and I think Andy and Richard, you guys understand that, right? Yeah, I think that's that's our job. Really, is not to just uh, is to is to respond to the input from the community and and listen to it, listen to it very closely, 
and not just try to put forth you know what we think is a solution we're, we're presenting a couple of different options this evening we'll present more uh in the future and hear from the community on on what's working or not working uh in sunderland and what we can do to help uh make it as as safe and accessible as possible i think we're hearing loud and clear that maybe not um you know that that certainly you know just putting through something that's going to accommodate 10% growth when there's a lot of questions mark marks out there, we'll, we're going to go back and do our homework on that. Um, and then how to re reinforce the pedestrian access and safety through the intersection as is certainly another one. And, and, and I, I think speed has been that, an issue too. I would hope at some point that, and again, I, I understand I'm an engineer as well. Um, and I know numbers to engineers are great stuff. You know, we can look at numbers and it tells us a lot of things. But I would, I would hope that part of Mass DOT's investigation includes some sitting time and, and talk time to the people that actually use it. And, and sometimes, and, and I go back many years ago when I was on the planning board, um, when we had a, an old time, we're telling the people that wanted to do a development that there's going to be a water issue. And they brought all kinds of hydrologists in and said, oh, no, there's not going to be a problem. It's perfectly fine. And after the, the first major storm, they had these huge washouts and all this, these problems. And if just listen to the old timer, you, you probably would have gone, you know, wouldn't have this problem. So, yeah, okay. again, I just hope at some point that you would take some time and come out and, and actually sit and talk to us and, and the residents and they can show you the exact what the concerns are as well. Absolutely. I hope yep. Tom doesn't call me an old timer, but before there was right turn on red in the intersection and I had to cross that intersection to go to school. The intersection was deemed dangerous back then because there was a crossing guard to get us across the intersection. Absolutely, Jimmy. I, I think know. we had one more question that we heard. I could hear Scott, but I, you might be on mute, Scott. Okay. Okay, I can, I can hear you through the room, but I can't hear you over the audio. <laughs> Does um, anyway, I did, I did have one thing to add. Someone had mentioned um, the flagpole. Um, certainly that's something that could be installed in the island. But um, one thing that uh, we, we try not to put there is like a monument. We don't want people crossing to the middle of the intersection. So if there's monuments or other things that could be potentially part of this project or another project in the future. Um, sometimes we've done a flagpole in Worcester. It was a clock, I think it was like a clock tower. They moved to one of the quadrants outside of the intersection um, and you had benches around it and other things. Um, but there, but you certainly could put a flagpole in, uh, in the middle or other vertical treatments. Some people have even planted trees and done like a Christmas tree or some, you know, the holiday treatments in the center island. Uh, but nothing that you would want anyone to go across the circulatory roadway and and draw them to the center of the intersection. No attractions, essentially, in there. Yeah. Because no. I, I know one of the things that people like are those four beds that have been, you know, beautifully planted, too. So, yeah. Okay. So um, does anybody have any more questions for uh, our folks at Mass DOT there? Sure. Can I just... What? One quick yeah. comment, which is um, the raised crosswalks were mentioned and, and we talked about pedestrian safety. And if that is in the next iteration of plans, I would also be curious on maintenance, maintenance. costs. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was thinking the same I, thing and I forgot about it. Lot, <laughs> yeah. I, I've experienced some raised crosswalks that get plowed in the winter and then need to get replaced every spring. So I'd just be curious Yep. Um, what, what the state's experience is with those and how often they need to be repaired and um, things like that. Sure. Um, one of the benefits to doing it as part of a full roadway reconstruction project is that we can build it at the same time we're building the roadway. If you're putting it in after the fact, it's just kind of, it can more easily uh, become detached from the roadway surface itself. So uh, other things in the design treatment that we look at is uh, perhaps a more gradual um, rise uh, over the run of then and then back down into this. So it's not uh, catching a plow edge or anything like that. 
Um, also just using kind of consistent materials. We would uh, use just the asphalt all the way through the intersection. Uh, some towns have done like cobble or brick and those can come up as well. Um, and then you can, you can always do like a stamped asphalt or stamped concrete that looks and or has some texture to it as well. Um, so there's different treatments certainly that we can look at, but maintenance is certainly a priority uh, on our end as well. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Jeff. Because when you when you mentioned the uh, the raise, I could hear George in the back of my mind saying, "Hmm, I don't know about that." Yeah, <laughs> yep. yeah that's so. It, it's good that we're still early in the process. So I think that that's you know it's still a lot of time for feedback and everything. So we appreciate all your time on that. Sure. Okay. So we'll we'll hear from you in about uh, six months or so then probably right. I would suspect I don't know if Rich will be on their radar before then, but uh, um, we could certainly I'll keep in touch with um, you all as far as uh, our progress and then uh, perhaps get on a meeting um, hopefully in yeah, within the next six months. All right, that'd be great because I know this is a, a as you've heard tonight a unique intersection with a lot of pedestrian and bicycle traffic and wide farm implements. We've got a pretty wide variety of things passing through there. So mm -hmm. sure, right. Um, okay, so right. Um, I, I guess if if there's any other you know feedback that you get at the town, mm -hmm. you know uh, after uh, after the meeting tonight, please go ahead and forward it on to me and I'll make sure Andy gets it and uh, so that he has it in his team. Okay. And, um, you know, we'll, again, we, we are early. I think this, this was helpful to get some, some early feedback, but there's plenty of more opportunity um, you know, for feedback and more informed feedback as again, Andy and his group uh, develop uh, some of the, the backup uh, information. Do, you know, I was just thinking it might be helpful if you just had like a bulleted list of the steps that you could shoot over. That'd be that'd be really helpful. Just you know, so that if we get questions, it'd be an easy reference. And is this presentation going to stay on the website so people can see it? I, I would think we'd want to leave it up for a while at least, right, Jeff? Makes sense, and then we get more feedback off of it too, Liz. Yeah. And just a reminder that our committee will be meeting Thursday night as, as long as we can get enough people and we will follow up on this. Um, and if we have any input, we'll pass it back to you through Jeff. Great. Yep. That'd be great. All right. Thanks for coming, guys. We appreciate it. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Give them a minute there. All right. <clears throat> Next up on our agenda, we have our minutes from October 13th. Can, do we want to adjourn the village center meeting? Can we... It was a presentation, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a hearing. Okay, but we had, we had, I think, had posted a joint meeting with you. Oh, did you? Okay. Is that correct, Jeff? I'll let you, I'll let you guys adjourn that. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. So I'd like a motion to adjourn the village center committee. So move. Second. Second. Okay. And I think, do we have to do a roll call vote? Did I read that somewhere? Uh, I don't think okay. for this case. All in favor, aye. Aye. Yeah. aye. Okay. See you guys on Thursday. All right. Thank Thanks for coming. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, guys. Great. Motion on the uh, minutes of October uh, 13th. I'll second. All right. All those in favor of the minutes of October 13th? Aye. Aye. All right. Next up, we have a vote to adopt the Sunderland MVP plan. I think we've talked about this a couple of times before. <sighs> so we had, uh, oh, good. Were you going to say something, Jeff? Nope. Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, as we've had our presentation in uh, last week and we've We've met numerous times on that. Um, <clears throat> and now it comes to the time where we get to vote on it. <clears throat> Anything you want to add to that, Jeff, at all? Or? Uh, 
No, just uh, some of the comments that we got back from the, the public comments that we got back from the, the meeting um, and subsequently were incorporated into it. And um, from that, the we're incorporated into the hazard mitigation plan, which is still open for public comment um, until the October 28th. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I move to adopt or sign the plan. There's been a lot, a lot of effort gone into that. There has. Yep. We have a second. What's that? Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of adopting the plan? Aye. 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 <laughs> Three to zero on that. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. you keep slowly moving out of the frame. <laughs> Uh, there you go, look at that. Um, okay, and next we have a vote to approve the Riverside Park Conservation Restriction. Um, do you just have a little refresher on that one for anybody who may not remember that one, Jeff? Sure. So as part of the park grant a few years ago, um, it was a requirement that, that uh, there be a conservation restriction on the property. Um, and we've been working um, with the Franklin Land Trust, um, who's going to hold the conservation restriction. And uh, I think we talked about it maybe a month and a half ago and finally got through legal review of, of ours and, and Franklin Land Trust and the states. Um, so this is just the, the final language to, to grant the conservation restriction trust. All right, thanks. Do we have a motion on the um, approval of the Riverside Park conservation restriction? Uh, so moved. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Three to zero on that one. Um, <clears throat> next up, we have our COVID 19 state of emergency, emergency update. I don't know what we have for updates. And I see, oh, there's Laurie. I have no new updates. Welcome. That, okay. That's probably a good thing at this point. It is. Um, Jeff and I sort of texted during the week saying he'd heard there was an uptick, another uptick at UMass, but I never heard anything from Cheryl for new cases for Sunderland okay. with that second uptick. So, so Lori, can I ask you a question? Do you, sure. are, have you been in contact with the Board of Health or are we get everything straightened out with Maven and UMass and all that kind of stuff? I don't know. Um, Cheryl's explanation to me was that if UMass acknowledges it before she sees it, then she has to go looking for it. Yeah. And she's not necessarily seeing them there. So I don't know if they've straightened that out or not. I think there was there is a Board of Health meeting Tomorrow night, I was going to have been on. Yeah, and, and, and my, my concern is just that that we, that the Board of Health is getting the information that they need. That That's probably the most, to, to us, that's the most, and I think that was a concern. And they, and from what I took from our meeting last week is that there was a concern about how, um, they contacted one another. So I, I think that's been rectified. I think Anne um, has given Caitlin her telephone number or direct contact. And so I think that that's worked itself out, but okay. But you haven't heard of any additional in Sunderland? No, no additional cases in Sunderland. Okay. Did you have any, any feedback or anything you wanna share from the meeting with UMass at all, Jeff, or? Uh, yeah, so we um, we met with the chair of the Board of Health um, and the police chief, uh, as well as um, Ann Becker and Jeff Hescock and uh, Tony and Sally Lenowski from Off Campus Housing um, last Thursday to talk a little bit more about the communication um, 
both between the organizations and, and making sure that we had a plan in place and, and backup plans in place. And then also about uh, joint communications to residents um, of our shared communities uh, and how we can improve those, those communications. And we're actually having a, a follow-up um, this Thursday with the, the police chief and off-campus housing and um, external relations to actually come up with a plan. So um, hopefully there will be some more of that uh, outreach directly to, to students in the community um, where we get both the university's messaging and, and the community's messaging on social distancing and gathering sizes and, and keeping people safe. Um, the university has packets and my hope is to include information on like code red and how to stay involved in Sunderland and not just get announcements from the university as well. Yeah, that'd be good. All right, great, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody have any other updates on COVID for this week? Uh, just a couple of things. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about this now, but um, one of the things is on October 30th is the deadline. Oh, and the lights oh, go out. The lights again. <laughs> See, it's not just the town offices. That's right. Oh, wait, it is the town offices. Yeah. <laughs> Saving energy um, is the deadline for round two of the coronavirus relief funds. Um, and so I think there was originally Sunderland was eligible for 323,000 um, total. And uh, what I've seen other communities, I think I mentioned this, other, other communities are sort of applying for the full amount and then giving it back. And um, I uh, handed out a, a, well, put on the SharePoint side, a, a breakdown of sort of where I was thinking that was gonna um, come in. But I guess the, the key points are we're not limited to the categories that we apply for. So if we apply for say 200,000 in PPE and we only wind up spending $25, but we need signage of 100,000, that's fine as long as it's an eligible expense. Um, okay. And then we return any money for that we either don't spend or we spend on something that is not eligible, which I, we, I, don't think we have done so far and we are trying very hard not to, um, but th those are the only two caveats. So um, I didn't know if there was any feedback on that approach or questions, yeah. I was gonna ask uh, the categories that you had presented and the dollar values were from feedback from department heads, not just swags. And I appreciate that energy and effort. I'd also like to not just be asking for everything we can possibly get so it doesn't seem like we have a plan. I'm of mm -hmm. always the mindset, have a plan, know where you're gonna put it, right? Know where those resources are needed and where they should be allocated for. And then if they're not needed, then that's fine. I can value that versus just asking for the maximum amount because it's convenient. I think that's lazy personally. And, and I, and I agree with Scott, but I also also know is like on the on the senior center, yep. you know there there's concerns. Um, the town of Whiteley um, just spent money to uh, purchase a tent with a heater that they could use that the senior center, and they're going to donate it to the senior center so the senior center can can use um, that tent to extend um, the food program and or whole program. Now, I don't think most of us thought at that time that we need to be buying a tent. Maybe what they did, they're, they're, they're very smart people. <laughs> my, my guess is that it, they didn't, but they, it, you know, our, I would say my priority is that we, we wanna make sure that the Board of Health has the necessary um, financial support to do what they, they have to do. Mm -hmm. The second, and, and just as important, is that all of our employees 
um, and, and to see what the employees have done, town clerk especially, what she's done to make the building open for early voting is pretty amazing. Um, so that, that has to be a, that, a priority. And, and my third, and, and I, I say 1A, 1B, 1C, is that, and, and we have said this to, to, to Ben, the principal at, at the Sunderland Elementary and Darius, the superintendent, is that the schools have the tools that they need yep. for, um, to get our kids the education that they, they need. And I, and I have to say, I have heard from a multitude of parents the great job that, that Sunderland Elementary is doing right now. And that, that reflects very highly on the staff and the um, administration and more importantly, parents and the children that go there. So, but, so I, I, you know, I, I know what you're saying, Scott, but uh, at the same time, I don't think when, the, when we first had to put in a money um, request that we had any idea what we were going to need. Um, total in, in total because it, it, it's changing it's changes as we sit right now you know and and who knows what's going to happen next week it does help that we've got that little bit of flexibility in there too at least it gives us a little a little you know a little easier moving around the money than than we might normally have well you know you talk to Lori. i mean you know maybe maybe you know if if we if there's there's stuff that we need for uh a, a, a a dispensing site, emergency dispensing site. I mean, may, maybe there's there's items that that are going to be needed for that that we don't, you know, maybe sure. you know maybe we we have to buy zero, you know, uh, um, sub zero freezers because I you know some of the some of the uh, um, vaccines that are coming out have to be stored at some at sub zero temperatures. I, I mean, I don't know. I just think we need to be ready um, to respond. However. And whenever we need it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. <clears throat> right. I know what Scott says. Scott, I, 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 yep. I respect what Scott is saying. I, I agree with him. Yeah, it's important. Although this one thing I think this has all taught us is to be a lot more flexible and think a little differently than you usually do. So yeah, and, and I, I would I would say that I would say I don't I don't have a problem asking for the full amount. Um but I would I would say it's important for us not to spend it just because it's there. That's yeah, probably exactly. more, that's probably more important to me. Um, and and it's and it's just I, I think that's that's up to us to make sure that the money that we're actually spending is money that we have to spend. And and if and if we give and if we give some money back, that's fine. Um, just don't spend money because um, you have it. And, and I and I don't think we don't do that to begin with. You know, and, and I think that you know the the two key things you, you mentioned the emergency dispensing site and when vaccines become available that's a big uh, less than clear expense, and the other is that um, as of December thirtieth there's no federal or state funding, so um, I don't think that there's a uh, universal acknowledgement that by December 30th we will all have been vaccinated or or be safe or have herd immunity at that point. Um, you know, so there's also thinking, and I think we're allowed to purchase up to a 60-day supply of PPE. So it's sort of also preparing for for um, you know the the first half of calendar year 21, um, and making sure that we have sufficient supplies. Um, going forward. Right, Actually. starting in. Yeah, that's, that's a good point because it, we're clearly not going to see a vaccine before the end of the year at this point. So, or, or you know, in any number at the very least. So, <clears throat> so uh, I had one other uh, different mm. COVID update, which is, um, and I, I guess it relates back to the, the meeting with UMass, which was um, one of the resources that's available is um, or potentially available is a, a stop the spread site and I think that 
there was some confusion um, about Bay State in Greenfield and uh, they do have a testing facility. Um, I think it's, it's not an official state stop the spread um, site because of some confusion. Um, but it, as a red community, we do have uh, we do have the option to request those types of resources. Um, and I know that Amherst, um, while well, not in the county, uh, but a neighboring community is also red and has also been requesting it. And so wanted to uh, talk to uh, present that to the select board and, and hear your feedback about maybe working with Amherst um, to find a, a local, you know, Northern Hampshire, Southern Franklin uh, testing site. Um, and then the other thing that I was on a call uh, a couple hours ago and uh, community health is doing mobile testing sites and I was going to reach out to mm -hmm. them and, and one of the suggestions was um, maybe they could spend a day at, at if we're seeing them in, in you know particular areas of town, um, maybe they could spend a day in, in each of those areas and do more um, location-based uh, mobile testing. So I'm gonna certainly explore the mobile option more and, and get a better yeah. understanding, but wanted to, uh, present the option of working with Amherst on, on one of the state stop the spread sites and hear what the select board had to say about that. And the EMD, Lori. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I was um, out working in my, my daughter's yard the other day and, and one of the neighbors came over to express her, her concern um, about the availability of testing. Especially now that you know Sunland have been in, in a, a, and I, I think if you go back to the original when the COVID first started, we all were we all were told um, about the importance of testing. I don't think that's changed, and I think if that if we can get an opportunity to 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 make it easier for our residents that want to get a test to get a test. Um, I think it much easier to do contact tracing if you know you have people that are testing positive. And so I, I would say if you're looking for a vote, my vote is yeah, if anything we can do to get increase our increased the availability of testing would be a great thing in my, my opinion, Jeff. And uh to, to clarify, I think one of the things I was also looking for is um, feedback on the idea of working with Amherst versus requesting our own with the knowledge that uh, how important is it to have a site within Sunderland um, versus something just closer than Greenfield or Holyoke? I, I think, in, in my opinion, I don't think it's, 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 it's a bad thing um, to, to partner. Um, I think it's a good thing, and and I think you would have you would have trouble right now finding Greenfield as a, a viable alternative to get a test. Right. From this person that told me they had to go to Springfield to get a test. Yeah, it seems and, like much. I and and whatever resources we can wheel in to have availability more locally, I'm all behind it. Yeah, and especially given how closely knit we are with Amherst and where the, the caseload lies and everything, working more closely with them makes a lot of sense. And I like the mobile idea. I think that's a, that's a unique approach to it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Laurie. Yep. Till next week. Till next week. <laughs> and hopefully it's the same level of reporting. Nothing exactly. Report. It's a good stuff. Yep. What I want to know is when we go from red to gray or yeah, yellow with to you gray. Again. Yeah, there's yeah. some talk about yep. that and how it's being calculated. But I, believe yep. me, it, it's impactful and it's it's very irksome. Yes, very. Well, the, the best thing that, that we had, I think the best thing that came out of, personally, the best thing that came out of the meeting that we had with UMass last, last week was the discussion about positivity, positivity. Right. And to know, and, and I thought that was that sometimes, you know, the, the whole green, yellow, 
gray, red, whatever. It, it was always, I think most of us always had a problem with that. I understand why they do it, I guess. But uh, I mean, the rate of positivity is probably the most important thing right now. Right. All right. Well, thanks. Keep our fingers crossed for a quiet week. You know? yep. Good night. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> All right. Um, next up on our, so we have our placeholder for discussions of employee wage adjustments. Uh, do we have any new economic data or information since last week? Uh, the state did release their estimated, uh, the cherry sheet estimates um, from the governor's refiled fiscal year 21 budget, um, which includes basically level funding for chapter 70 and, and local aid. Um, so I think that the big pieces that we're missing right now that, that we need to nail down are um, the, the local, local taxes receipts. and local receipts. Yep. Yep. And then we'll, we'll have a pretty complete picture of, of where we are. So in that in that release of the governor's again governor's budget first pass, uh, was there changes in the assessments? Because usually that is where they get you, whether it's pilot, PBTA, mm -hmm. etc. Um, so we, we can have our revenues look relatively rosy or even, or you know, our our projections look okay, and then you look down the column and the assessments tick up. Yeah, I think I don't. I think I think uh, I think there wasn't a big uptick in the assessments. I think the the regional transit authority was up a little bit, okay. um, but I didn't mm -hmm. see a a large offset um, okay. in that well, area. It sounds like we're getting closer, and that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So kind of we're probably right around with our original estimate, like mid-November. So we'll have a better idea. Yep. All right. Keep our fingers crossed on that too. <clears throat> um, now we get to our select board and town administrator updates. <clears throat> Any select board? Up? All set. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. All right. Do you have anything, Scott, this week? Uh, actually, if I could, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chair, there's yeah. I received uh, two calls, one yes, one Saturday and one this morning from a uh, uh, Butters of the whatever it's called, the Sugar Bush Meadows new name, yeah. and I'd rebranding, like rebranding. I if for a combination of excess noise, also the sizes and group of group gathering. Um, like to take the time to thank the police for the work that they've done there when called. Um, but as has been described, you know, when the police roll in, the group scatters and then subsequently reforms when the police leave. Uh, this activity uh, type of activity has been going on for a little bit of time now. I struggle with this notion that suddenly because the project is developed that it's up to the town to, you know, be the, be the heavy hand. And I, I feel that we're at a point where very early on in their business life that we should bring the management team in and skip the whole letter part and bring them in with the police chief and say, here's a frequency of calls, no names, no nothing like that. You know, here's the responses. That's just public data. Yep. and reinforce the point that you know they committed to us to being good neighbors they committed to us to being a good community they committed to us to being a good management team when i say us i mean the totality of the town and what i'm hearing from concerned neighbors and what we'll probably see in the police log is that maybe their management team could step up their game a little bit and uh hopefully extend their reputation for being the quote community they wanted to be. And if this is the community they wanted to be is what's manifested in the last couple of months, then, you know, we should be laughed at wholly because once again, Sunderland fought the good fight and got lied to bold face. So I'd like to bring them in. I know they haven't been very receptive, but it angers me that instead of, 
coming for a sewer line extension. They're very happy to return our calls. Uh, when it comes to something like this, we don't hear anything but crickets. So bring them in, let's talk to them, let's do a little yelling and let's make sure they're gonna be good citizens. If not, and Jeff, I'd like to also, cause I'm on my soapbox and you can hear me <laughs> volume and pace. I wanna document this and send it right to the DHCD and say, thank you so much for the public support for exactly the kind of housing we told you was being presented and we didn't need, and this is what we got. I like that point. At some I point, think we the, could... the DHCD has got to understand that simply approving a project, as Tom was saying earlier, engineers love numbers, simply mm -hmm. approving a project because it fits you know, inside of, well, you don't have enough affordable housing, so you get everything you can possibly get. It doesn't fit in every community. And the decision that they made a decade ago right now is manifesting itself with maybe the need for additional police officers. The town has to pay for that. That's public safety. You know, disgruntled yeah. neighbors and abutters. That's not cool. We didn't ask for that. Well, that's if they very can't true. manage the project, maybe the DHCD should just take their money back. You know, the, the problems that they tried to solve with towns like Wellesley and things like that don't necessarily translate to our issues out here. Again, thanks Excellent for the soapbox, point. but I think we got to bring yeah. them in and say, listen, you know, pick up, step up your game. I think we could probably find a little room on our next agenda, huh, Jeff? Sure. Yeah. And if, and if, and if they don't want to be in, just bring in the police chief. Oh, well, we can have a discussion anybody, there. Anybody with wants that. to participate, bring in the chief. Anybody who's got a video, throw it up there and then throw that right in front of them and say, hey, this is your property. How are you handling it? That's an excellent point. Thank you. Um, do you have any um, separate updates, Jeff? It, probably not. It's been so quiet, I know. But <laughs> I, I just actually wanted to um, shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, two recent events that our state senator and state representative were doing um, over the weekend on Saturday. They did. Uh, was a two hour live broadcast from Mike's Maze um, with Monty Belmonte and um, they interviewed, it was in support of uh, the clerks and the voting process and to encourage people to vote. Um, and our own town clerk was there and, and gave an interview mm -hmm. and, and did a great job. And I just wanted to give her a shout out. And then today um, the state Senator and, and representative Blaze and um, uh, Representative Dom and Representative Kerry, so sort of the West, Western Mass delegation all did a kayak trip um, and took off from the Sunderland boat launch um, today. And uh, there was a Facebook Live uh, event going on. And um, so just wanted to mention that, that they're out in the community and, and looking out for our interests. And I think um, there's scheduled to come in and, and give a more official update in a couple weeks, um, but just wanted to um, give a shout out and, and thank them for, for coming to the community and um, helping to encourage people to vote and, and talk about our, our incredible natural resource in the river and so for their support. That's great. Good points. Yeah. <clears throat> it sounds like it was a good event and they had a nice day for it today too. The weather held out, which was good. So. Um, all right. And do we have any uh, general public comments at all? We can reach that portion of the evening. I know we've had a number of discussions earlier, so we might be public commented out for the night. So <laughs> <laughs> just for tonight, anyway. <clears throat> all right. Um, our next meeting is going to be Monday, October 26th, one week from tonight, same time. So. <clears throat> Um, I just saw something flash on there. Hold on one second. Um, I, otherwise, if there's nothing else, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, yep. I just realized that I did. Uh, there's a, uh, what is it? A, a cer certificate of adoption with a, some for the MVP plan with some whereas clauses. And I know you voted to adopt it. Do you wanna 
actually see that. Um, I can pull it up on the screen, or or is that good to for go? the MVP that we've been working on for the last six months? <laughs> yeah, yeah prob <laughs> prob probably move move to adopt as written and signed would be the motion I would make. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sorry. Do we have a second on that? I can. All those in favor to move and adopt as noted by Scott. Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Motion to adjourn. We have a second. All right. All those in favor of adjournment at uh, 824? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next All week. Next week.